Hi, everyone. I'm uh, excited to introduce Claire DeMarco, the Associate Director of Digital Strategy, Strategies and Innovation at Harvard Library. She's going to demo Harvard Digital Collections 2.0 for us today. And uh, we call it HDC for short here at Harvard. And so HDC is Harvard Library's Blacklight Search and Discovery interface for more than 6 million publicly accessible items from our digital repository. And the major features included in this latest release are associated with creating an account and any user is free to sign up. No Harvard affiliation is required. Signing up for an account allows users to create and manage lists of items as well as save dynamic searches. So I will, without further ado, pass it off to Claire. Thanks so much, Vanessa, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, so one thing that's always wonderful to me about these community calls is the different people that are able to pop in and pop out at different times in our community. So for some of you, um, this may feel uh, familiar because I did a, um, a a virtual uh, kind of walkthrough of our designs at the Blacklight Summit the last time. And um, so, so now you get to see it in action in, in the live environment, but I wanna put some context on it that'll be specifically um, interesting for the Spotlight community because I'm here demoing a Blacklight instance, not a Spotlight instance. So we wanted to uh, just take a moment to, ex to share how for us, this, this ecosystem of our, our exhibits uh, in Spotlight are represented uh, in our Blacklight interface and how we can see the future of that bridge being built um, uh, in our Harvard Library ecosystem. So uh, what I'm sharing right now is the homepage of Harvard Digital Collections, uh, which when we kind of decided to move forward with a, a 2.0, got a little bit of a facelift that helps us to walk through um, some of the changes that you're going to see. So uh, as a history lesson, Harvard Digital Collections as an interface at all um, launched in July of 2019 after 16 weeks of development. And Harvard Digital Collections 2.0 similarly had 16 weeks of development. Um, so we've only done two full work cycles on this product and we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish in that time. Uh, what we found after we launched uh, version 1.0 uh, was the opportunity to then ask people um, from this basic interface, what more would you like to do? And we also had an eye on all of the Blacklight features that we weren't including in our kind of initial release because it was very customized. So um, for our uh, Blacklight installation, we're not actually running a separate Blacklight Solar. This is calling through uh, an API to our uh, library cloud, which Vanessa has presented on in previous Spotlight calls. Maybe when we post this on the YouTube channel, we can put a link to Vanessa's earlier library cloud calls um, to explain that relationship a bit more. Um, but uh, so, so because of that, there are a lot of features associated with having your own index that's associated with the application that we couldn't use out of the box, one of which is bookmarking. So we knew that Blacklight could do bookmarking and we knew that um, folks familiar with this type of interface might expect that. So we, we asked them a little bit about what they would like to see from some sort of bookmarking feature. And then we tried to build to those specifics. So I'm just going to read out um, some of the, um, the kind of things that were on our must have list. So we wanted people to have the ability to create sets of material. So to identify items that they would want in their set, um, either individually or kind of what page they were looking at in a search result. And then we wanted them to be able to give it a title that they could use um, and to select either from the search result or the item detail, kind of how to put those into those, um, those sets. And then obviously the, the basic CRUD functions of create, um, uh, we want to be able to revise it and delete it. Um, so th those things were there. But again, since we weren't using a separate index, we had to have a database to write those sets to and a relationship with Library Cloud for doing that. Thankfully, again, if you've seen other presentations by Vanessa, you know that 
Vanessa uses Library Cloud to create sets for Curiosity for our Spotlight instance. So we wanted this to be aligned with that and to not diverge from it so much that now we're supporting multiple types of infrastructure. So the other person that's on the call from Harvard right now is Phil Plensner, who uh, is one of our senior developers who is really instrumental in helping to build that bridge between uh, the library cloud set building function that Vanessa uses to create curiosity sets. And what would it mean to have a similar function that was writing to a database associated with Harvard Digital Collections so that any member of the public could create a set? We wanted to obviously keep those as discrete things. One is, not, you know, one is a curatorial function within the library and the other is a, an account function for an individual user. So with all that on the table, um, we set a, 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 out to engage in our 16 week work cycle. And um, we also did an, a couple of other fun things along the way that I wanted to share. So I'm just going to do some live uh, work, which, you know, there's means there's always going to be something weird that happens. But um, so when I do a search in Harvard Digital Collections, uh, you know, I get back a, a list of results. For folks who've looked at Harvard Digital Collections before, you'll see that we took this opportunity of touching the application to make some UI updates as well. Um, the one that I think would be the most interesting to the Spotlight community, because we are hoping to eventually bring some of these UI enhancements into our curiosity space as well, um, is the reorientation of this top area of the page where you have the ability to clear your all your search terms and filters or just X out specific search terms or filters. So, You'll, you'll notice that as I filter, these all of the, the terms and the filters are added at the top as individual things that I can X out. And we thought that by reorienting this area, making it clear that these functions had to do with the term that I've searched and what I've done to that term would be a clearer experience for people. And, and when we did test it with, with users, they responded positively. Separating that and keeping it up there um, and then the only functions down here are the results and how I change uh, my view of the results, either paginating or changing the layout. So those were some things that kind of came along the way. Um, we also made some changes to our filtering experience um, that, again, may be of interest to the Spotlight community insofar as um, it, you can only you know, filter on and show metadata that you have. And uh, early on in Harvard Digital Collections, we only had four categories of, of metadata. So we've expanded the, the uh, ways in which, let me, if I get out of image, you'll see an example of this, the ways in which we've, we've expressed what a type is rather than the format. So format for us used to be image, page turned object, um, audio visual, uh, I'm forgetting the, the fourth one, um, basically how they're stored in our digital repository service, which doesn't mean anything to the end user. But we also knew that these, um, you know, when, you, when you're working with aggregated data, there are some, there are going to be some false uh, matches in terms of what the fields are. So we have um, a category now of, uh, that, that blows out some of these um, kind of bigger categories into smaller components. Um, and, and people have respond, responded positively to that. So uh, those are the things that came along the way, but what we are really here to demo is the idea of um, creating a list. Um, so one thing to note is that um, you don't have to be logged in to see that this is a feature. And that was a really nice um, kind of uh, a um, commitment to openness. We don't want people to have to create the account before they use the service. So even as a non-signed in user, um, I get my results and I see that there are things that I can do. And when I try to do them, I then get prompted to sign into an account or create an account. Um, I obviously have one, but I wanna show the create page because the distinction that we had on this create page was a little explanation of what you can do when you create an account. So I think all of this you know, translates very well to thinking about the Spotlight experience because we have folks that um, we want to encourage to do things like bookmarking and, and other uh, things potentially in a Spotlight experience as well. 
And it's always tough to communicate to users when you introduce a feature, how they first get to it. So we had to, you know, account for all the front doors. Um, so like I said, I, I've already created an account. So I'm going to log in. And now that I'm logged in, um, I get a modal from what I had clicked before that allows me to add this item to a list. And it gives me the thumbnail again, a little bit of information about the item. And then I can add it to existing lists that I have, or I can create a new list. And so when I create a new list, I add the item and it says this item has been added to your list. So we'll come back to this your list uh, link in a minute. But there's other ways to add things to my lists, one of which um, is to add all of these items to a list. So if I click all of these, it says you're adding 12 items to a list. Those are the 12 items that were shown on that search results page. So I say, oh, look, it remembers that waterfalls was the last list I was adding to. Uh, of course, all of you know that that didn't just magically happen. We engineered that to be so. So I'm going to add all those 12 items to my list. It says these 12 items have, or these items have been added to your list. One last way I can add things to a list. Oh, see, I told you something would go wrong as you're, as you're searching. Let's pick a different one. Oh, no. Oh, no. And it's recorded. Let's try one more time. Okay, sorry about that. We'll, we'll log the bug. Um, the other way to add items to a list is that when you get to a search result and you're looking at um, the tools and related link box, all the things that you can do, you can download um, this, I this item in multiple resolutions. Uh, you can get a permanent link to this page. You can go over and see this record in our image catalog. Um, you can uh, learn a little bit about IIIF here, copy the manifest link to put it in a viewer if you don't, um, if you already know what that means or learn more about IIIF if you don't. But let's just say we wanna add it to the list. Again, I'm gonna add it to waterfalls. Now, you may be thinking, but Claire, oh. Alexa wants to put waterfalls on my shopping list. Interesting. Um, you may be thinking, but Claire, you've added the same item three times. Um, and the reason for that is we want people to be able to add an item to multiple lists. And we know that um, once they, if they meant to add this to the list in any of those, um, the versions of the ways that I'm showing you, you can do that. Once they go over to their list via this year list link, they're only gonna see it there the one time, but that's what they meant to do. Um, so we have, um, the, remember those 12 uh, items should be all be in here. And there are a couple of things I can do from this page now of my list. I can change the name of what I'm calling this. I could take individual items out of my list by deleting them. Um, I can, uh, go through and click on any of these individual items and go um, go to the item detail page. And I know that the last time that I updated this list was today. So this is kind of the information that someone would have uh, when they come to this, this page. Now this page exists as part of my account. So we, we introduced the concept of the, the breadcrumb here so that people understand where they can find more information about the things that are personal to them. So there are two ways to get to this. One is by following back the breadcrumbs. The other is this my account link in the upper right. So for at my account, I can review and manage my lists. I can also see any saved searches. That's a black light out of the box feature. Um, or I can manage my account, um, change my password or username. I can also save the, my recent, any of my recent searches to my saved searches or delete my search history completely. Now, the one thing, and I'm, I'm going through this quickly, I understand, but um, I want to leave time for questions. The one thing that we had on the wish list for this um, work cycle that we didn't get to um, complete 
is the idea of when I'm on my list, um, having a button that says export. And the, the um, option that we think is most useful for people in exporting would be to export um, either in uh, just a CSV format um, that they could use for uh, harvesting into some other uh, exhibit site like Spotlight or to, um, to use in Omeka or to um, share with a student list, um, maybe pull things into Canvas, any place where a CSV could be recognized. The other thing that we've thought about is um, uh, just JSON with the manifest, the IIIF manifest links for all the items so that you could bring all 12 items over to a Mirador viewer, for example. So the CSV version is um, in kind of uh, in the development branch of, of Library Cloud and being worked on um, uh, as our next step, step that we hope to complete. Um, we had some infrastructure work that we're, that we've slotted in between some AAA, rebuilding our IIIF architecture uh, that's happening right now. But uh, my hope is that that button will be there very soon. And the story that I have about that is uh, the very first piece of feedback that we got from a user was a um, a library school uh, instructor at Simmons here in Boston saying that she wanted to share a list with her students. And so we were excited to see that we were in, we had indeed responded to initial user research, then were kind of reinforced by user research saying you're on the right track. The nice thing about my interaction with that user was that I had the opportunity to ask her kind of well, what is it that you would want to do? How would you want to share? Because we have some ideas of what we're capable of doing with sharing. But if she had said, like, I want to tweet it out, that's not something that we were going to be able to support um, with our next uh, release. So it was really interesting to hear kind of her ideas for, for sharing, which she said, oh, I just went and grabbed each of those, um, each of those URLs and put them in a spreadsheet, which is a great solve for what she needed at the time. Um, and and so we're happy to know that we're kind of in the in the right uh, ballpark as far as our users are concerned. So um, our we don't have another work site active work cycle on this product planned uh, in the in the fiscal year, but what I do hope that we will be able to do is introduce a lot of the changes that we made um, in terms of the interface um, on Harvard Digital Collections over to um, Curiosity, our Spotlight interface so that those two things are in sync. Um, for those of you who hadn't seen this before, again, um, the uh, one of the ways to get to Curiosity from Harvard Digital Collections is when you're trying to filter down and get more curated information, well, here's a whole set of curated collections that you can look at. Um, also, if you get to something that is in a, a Curiosity collection, there's a link on the, that um, tools and related links over to the Curiosity collection where that um, image appears. So um, hopefully these will continue to be products in sync and we are excited to continue working on them and to continue getting feedback from users. So I encourage you all to create accounts, um, use the, the feature, um, uh, test the boundaries of it as as we saw with the bug today and let us know what you think. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Claire. Nice job. We certainly appreciate it. Did a great job on that. Very interesting. Uh, questions for Claire? Okay, and I'll just, I'll just ask then this, uh, once again, this is coming out of the Harvard Library Cloud. Uh, was it difficult to, to get the links to Curiosity in there? Uh, Claire, how did, how did you get that functionality integrated in uh, to this interface? Well, um, the, the great news is Vanessa had the foresight um, when, when thinking about developing Curiosity as a service to make sure that every item um, that is added to a Curiosity collection, there's a link in the library cloud rec record that we call the object in context link. So if it appears in a Curiosity collection, there's a dedicated link there. If it appears in the Harvard Art Museum, there's a link to the Harvard Art Museum. 
and when it appears here, there's a link to, to this site as well. So the nice thing is the, the, the kind of linking aspect uh, is, is a core function of, of the library cloud record. Great. Um, Claire, Claire, I have a question. So as it stands at this moment, um, are you, is there any integration between digital collections and um, this list you might create and your ability to create a, a curiosity collection exhibit? Is, is that, so, am I being fair there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is something that we're really excited um, to see how curators respond to. So um, for, for folks who know how uh, Vanessa manages the service, um, she works with the curators to, to um, uh, import all of the items, uh, to harvest all the items through our OAI PMH harvester into Spotlight. And so right now that means that they have to provide a list of IDs. So they kind of have to know what they want to pull in. This for the first time gives them the opportunity to maybe visually search through and search their, their own content in a new way to see how things might render together before making that commitment. And so they might be able to, and we're hoping that they see kind of um, visual connections between items um, that when they're just thinking about their catalog records, they're not aware of to then pull those things together. And, and our hope then, because we built this infrastructure in common is that once we get the export function, the export can feed right into Vanessa's import. Um, we still want to have Vanessa as that, that middle layer because we don't open up our, our curiosity um, service so that curators are making their own collections or their own exhibits. They can, um, they can edit them once they're created, but they don't actually make new ones. So that, that's the service level offering that we provide. Um, and so, but I think it'll make Vanessa's role of intake a lot easier because people will have kind of investigated what's there. And I'll share one um, kind of interesting side note, which is we've, we've had um, some inquiries from one of our largest um, uh, collection, you know, collections in the traditional library sense, not a digital collection. Um, so we have uh, the Judaica collection at Harvard Library has been one of the most prolific in terms of getting their content digitized. So when you look in Harvard Digital Collections and you limit to Judaica, there are millions of items in there. But th they've been precluded from kind of doing a lot with curiosity because they have so much. And so it's been hard for them to slice down and decide how they want to set up exhibits. And so we're really hoping that now that they can search within kind of the things that have been digitized and really get that, that um, the scale and the scope of, of what's in there, they can come up with some really interesting collections to build out with Vanessa. Thank you. I do see that um, uh, David has a question for you in the chat. Maybe we'll oh. we, Mike, is it, should we just take that one and then um, we'll stop this recording after Clara answers the question here? Yeah, yeah so that, that is a really interesting question about, um, uh, what's in a user's um, list. We are not uh, kind of, uh, it would not be easily, easily mineable for us to kind of use for analysis purposes. And we would definitely want to let people know if we were planning on doing that. I think that there are other mechanisms that I would prefer to incorporate, um, such as feedback surveys, maybe a little pop up on the site to, to get feedback from people who are using the feature. Um, you know, tell us more about this. Um, but but for right now, it's it's private, not only to each individual, but it's not something that at a service level we're monitoring at all. Very good. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>